So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for really joining us for this uh, uh, first round uh, table discussion uh, as part of ICOMOS UK Digital Technology National Committee. Uh, I'm honored to have uh, 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 five guests with me today to talk about the interesting topic uh, in, 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 the, um, in that field. I'll introduce my guest later, but I'll, I would like to start talking about a, a little bit, giving you an introduction about ICOMOS, just in case you are not yet a member of ICOMOS. So ICOMOS is a, a, a national um, non-profit, non of course, a charity, organization, heritage body, whatever you, you want to put it under which umbrella. And the main aim of ICOMOS is basically to push uh, and uh, develop uh, with other partners best practice of heritage uh, 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 preservation, interpretation, development uh, from different perspectives. That's why ICOMOS has... Um, uh, different committees. Uh, uh, this committee, uh, one of the uh, the committees that looking at different uh, areas of heritage. Uh, uh, please um, uh, look at ICOMOS website and uh, uh, see the diversity of committees we have, and see where uh, if you are not member, see what uh, where your interest would lie, and then. If you would like to join ICOMOS, always write to the main contact uh, on the website. Uh, my colleague uh, will bob in the chat some links to help you. The Digital Technology National Committee is looking to really develop best practice and advocating best practice in, uh, in heritage, in using technology in heritage preservation and conservation from uh, creative uh, community uh, and the science and engineering perspective. So this first round table discussion uh, that uh, uh, talk about best practice and explore challenges with engaging uh, uh, community with cultural heritage uh, is one of the three round table discussion for 2022-2023, uh, which will uh, we'll look at other uh, uh, dimensions from engineering, from digital technologies uh, perspective. So hopefully you will find that interesting. Uh, that to, uh, to, could I ask everyone, apart from our speakers, to uh, mute their uh, microphone and switch their camera off so that save bandwidth for everyone in the meeting. And uh, just to make you aware that this meeting is recorded, so if you don't wish to be seen in, in the recording later when you speak, please uh, switch your camera off as well. So uh, just to not uh, take more time and keep to the time uh, we uh, plan, um, we have five uh, uh, diverse uh, guests, I would say, from research, uh, practice, practice uh, uh, domains. Uh, we have uh, Professor Stewart Jeffrey from uh, Glasgow School of Art. We have uh, Dr. Claire, um, Be Claire Belleros, uh, and Dr. Brett Stevens from uh, uh, University of Portsmouth. We have Dr. Sarah Berry from Museum of London, and we have Dr. Alex Heldred from Mary Rose Museum. So you, the diversity is really needed for the, such dialogue and such discussion. So the plan of today is uh, each of our guests will uh, put uh, their statement about uh, uh, their view, their uh, perception about using digital technologies for uh, community visitor engagement. Um, but then after that, we'll move, uh, we'll move uh, um, uh, forward with three uh, sections to look at particular questions about engage, uh, engaging with the topic from different perspective. So uh, without further ado, I would invite our guests to start their statement. So uh, shall we go alphabetically in that? Uh, Alex, are you ready? If you would like to share any slides, please do. And you are muted. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have any slides. We had a complete equipment failure for over the weekend and, and Monday. So there aren't any slides. But we have a quite unique problem in that we have half of a display, half of a ship. So so what we do in the museum is try and show people what what they are missing and from, recreate from a basically half of a ship, uh, the image of a complete ship. Now we've done that in the past a number of ways. Uh, we've done that with um, drawings. So where you've got half a ship that then 
you've got a drawing of a complete ship over it. We've done it with uh, objects in the museum where the missing bits, so for example, the iron that disappears underwater that doesn't exist, we replace with things like um, frosted acrylic so that you're creating part of a missing object in order to give people an understanding. We have a, a museum that's on same deck levels as the ship that's exactly opposite. And we've transposed the objects that were found in one place into the, into the exact opposite space. So you can walk down this, this uh, walkway, looking at the ship on one side and the objects on the other. Um, we've also tried to use different technology as it evolves. So we'd love to have holograms, but instead of that, we try and populate the ship by projecting. We've got 66 different small, uh, vignettes that we put into the ship at specific places, so the carpenter in his cabin and various other things, in order to try and make something which, if you look at it out of context, is almost sort of stale and it's just an empty bit of wood because we haven't put all the cabins back yet. But in trying to use technology to, to make that more of a, uh, a realistic thing, I mean, our problem is is also how do you, we, we are the real thing. We've got so many real objects, 20,000 objects that, that came from the ship that, that, that tell us about Tudor life. And you don't want to get too unreal. So I think one of the challenges is to go too digital and, and to therefore miss the real thing. So one example of that would be is we got a phone app for kids and the person who was producing it wanted to do it in the middle of these long galleries on three different levels so that the, the, there are two people that that play out a game basically who who were sank the Mary Rose so it's aimed at children and we refused to allow it to be done on all three decks in the context gallery because we felt that the objects and the ship opposite were the context were the thing and we didn't want it to to be masked by digital uh, too much digitization so I think um Whilst we, we use it a lot, and for example, every single of the nine characters that we've chosen, we are able to put a profession to, has got a case dedicated to themselves with objects within it. And we have normal written labels and we've got the objects, but in every single case, we've got uh, clips of film that go into underwater, perhaps the excavation of other particular objects. So there are 10 or 11 objects on a timeline and you can touch on those and see a bit of excavation or it cuts into a small film that we did about somebody using something. So realizing that not everybody wants to read labels, uh, we show how an object is used, like a chalk line reel or um, even something like a ruler or, or a compass um, or a, a small hand uh, uh, watch, uh, sundial, small sundial, showing how those are used so that people can understand things in a different way. And the way that we evaluate that is basically by observing people, by talking to people. We have uh, somebody stationed in every single one of the um, various areas within the museum, the, the long corridors at, on three levels opposite the ship, and then the end galleries. There are six galleries around the ship, and they interact with them, and we also have questionnaires and things like that. So... I just think that uh, it's getting a balance and that's a difficult thing. You can get too, too much technology. At the moment, we've got quite a lot. We're working with the University of Portsmouth and they've done a number of different uh, methods of, of taking the, the half the ship and making a complete ship. And then one of the final ones is being able to sort of swim through it wearing a headset. And as you touch object, as you move fish away or swim through them, the, the ship gets populated with objects which are made up of scans of our original objects. So um, we're embracing all sorts of different things and we're trying to find that fine balance between an overkill and, and also what works best for explaining the things that we want to explain. Is that enough? <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. That's uh, really informing about what's happening with the uh, museum context. Um, thank you very much. I, I would like to move to uh, Brett. Brett, are you with us? I am here, yeah. Hello. yeah. Um, so I'm just going to just sort of introduce myself first, because I think it would help in, in explaining the sort of the next bit. So um, my original sort of background was in information systems and then moving over into creative technologies. So I come from a sort of um, a more sort of computer science background. So I think about um, heritage in, in a sort of strangely in an information sort of a way about how information is being passed from sort of museums to, to visitors to objects through to um, uh, digital experiences. Um, and so um, Alex has just set me up brilliantly because she's just described the three sort of stages of the things that I was going to talk about. So I was thinking, oh, 
sort of done it now, but I get I get to sort of summarize and round up in a conceptual level. So that's kind of what I'll probably do. Um, so what the, the, the question which is around um, how do we sort of see visitor engagement with cultural heritage sort of moving into digital technologies in the future? Um, I think we're all aware that there's sort of three sort of rough models of um, uh, sort of digital technologies. There's the sort of the alternative model, the kind of the additional model, and then there's a sort of augmentation model. Um, and like the alternative model is where um, you, in, instead of having uh, you know, a, a collection on display, you have to apply and, and add a, an additional sort of digital aspect to it and the collection stays sort of hidden behind doors. So um, you're not sort of necessarily um, replacing uh, a collection, but you're sort of um, creating an alternative digital um, portal to that kind of um, that collection. So and we've seen it with like, digital archives where um, objects are sort of stored, um, you know, hidden off site or sometimes in a completely different site and you can access those digitally. Um, the, the sort of second model is the sort of additional model, which is where um, you go to uh, a, a sort of a collection and you'll find the, the, the heritage objects um, or heritage sort of environment. Um, and then there's an additional but sort of unrelated kind of technology. Um, so uh, this is sometimes um, for, for a sort of whole museum or sometimes just for a subgroup. So you might find, you know, a case of objects for um, the adults, um, and then you might find a small game for a child or something that's a sort of additional kind of like model. Um, and those two are kind of really easy to, to kind of like pick out in, in, in sort of museums, because um, they're really easy to do. They're sort of, um, they're standalone. Um, you can kind of conceptualize them quite easily. They, they form sort of simple project. We can bid for funding to do simple projects um, and, and, you know, and we can kind of round that out and describe it quite easily. So you, you often find that in, in, in sort of um, you know, museum heritage organizations, places that have collections. Um, just, just as an extra caveat, I tend to work with places that have collections rather than architectural sort of heritage, um, which I guess is slightly different, but maybe that's Tarek's domain. Um, where I think it's going, though, is a much more um, augmented um, version of, of um, the sort of digital and physical. Um, so instead of having uh, a separate digital, a separate physical or a separate collection or, or a representation of a, of, a, of a collection in digital format, actually what you, if you think about it in terms of information, the physical objects or the physical collections provide some object or a context. And then the digital information that you associate with that can provide a, a different sort of, of, of information. And that together, those things form a sort of stronger whole, I think. Um, and that is, um, is starting to happen. Uh, Alex, you were talking about um, pres uh, projecting sort of little vignettes into the ship, you know, so you're combining this sort of digital technologies with, with, with the ship itself on a grand scale. Um, it happens um, in, in sort of small scales where you might have, um, you know, AR apps or things as you walk around. I think the change, the way it will develop though, is that those things will start to become more integrated as a kind of baseline. So um, instead of having a kind of separate one-off, this is a, an augmented version of this object. Um, it, we have to start thinking about um, the, the, the information that we have as a whole ecosystem. So we have a digital ecosystem and a physical ecosystem at the moment. But actually, what we need to be thinking about is in terms of um, an augmented ecosystem. Um, so that requires a bit of a sort of change in how we how we think about things. So instead of just um, having a um, you know a, a completely sort of separate digital thing, we need to think about the digital information as a preservation object in the same way that we think about our physical objects as as preservation objects. Um, we'll need a system where we can kind of like um, integrate those two things together, so that if we move a you know if we we loan out a, 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 an object from a collection, the digital object follows it and can track with it. Um, and if we move an object from a case to a different case or something like that, then the digital information flows with it. So we've got to, to think about um, these systems um, more as a kind of collective whole, I think. And I think that's part of the challenge that the people in sort of my area of creative technologies are starting to think about now. How do we actually have those things not as a, a as a one off? This is an augmented reality version of something or this is a virtual reality version of something. But how do we um, have a sort of physical and digital um, twinning of, of, of um, objects? And how do we be able to 
use that information and reuse it in different and interesting ways so that it follows along with the with the sort of the collection and the objects that we're, we're moving around. So. Thank you very much, Brett. That's really interesting. And may I ask uh, uh, our uh, uh, participants, please don't share screen and don't unmute yourself, please, to not interrupt our guest speakers. So I would move to uh, Claire now. Claire, would you like to share your screen? Um, so I, I, I did say I had slides, but I'm, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to go rogue and, and not. Absolutely um, fine. <laughs> Um, I'm also not going to talk about technology. I'm going to talk about people. So I'm from a museum, gallery, library and archive background and user studies backgrounds, audience research background, and that very much shapes my perspective. And I was going to use the next few minutes to kind of talk about some of my recent work around attempting to understand available audience research uh, relating to digital cultural heritage collections. Now, I realize that this is only one aspect of cultural heritage, but I think it's really important to have a proper understanding of who and how visitors, audiences use ac and access collections in a digital space, as it can really help to gain insights into visitor engagement with other digital technologies, whether that's in a digital, a physical or a, a hybrid cultural heritage environment. Now, I'm sure we're all aware you know, over the last 30 years, the number of online cultural heritage or digital um, cultural heritage collections and the number of, of digital visitors using those collections has increased. And there's also been the significant development around flexible and effective ways to, the, to assess the use, the impact and the value of those digital collections on engagement and visitor behaviour. But implementation actually varies across organisations across the sector. And this is quite challenging uh, to understand how these digital experiences, these digital collections, uh, collections feature in kind of behavioural practices of, of visitors and of audiences. And although this kind of use of collections and frequency of evaluation has been on the rise, whether it's actually meaningful in terms of audience engagement, um, in terms of audience understanding and in terms of appreciation is still really questionable. And we're doing all of these, these things, we're embedding technology, um, but we don't quite know how and why um, and what people are doing with it. And so I think it, it's, before you actually think about the use of digital technologies, it's important to try and understand the user of those digital technologies. So some of the work that I've been doing is looking at available material on audience, digital audiences between 2015 and 2021. Um, and there's actually really limited published material, at least, about how people use digital collections, how they are identified, how they're categorized. And the the while work does exist on, on digital audiences, in-depth kind of em empirical research has has really kind of slowed. And there could be a range of reasons for this, um, but I think a large one is probably lack of adequate funding um, and, and resource ultimately to undertake kind of robust research. Uh, but cultural heritage organizations do capture digital audience data, but most of that is quantitative. So it, it, it counts of people really, how many people, how long for, how long do they stay there? What do they do? Um, and majority of that is through DCMS and their performance indicator guidelines. But again, data collection methods vary between organizations and each, uh, each organization uses a method that's appropriate to whatever their situation is. And this focus on kind of the numbers, the quantitative reporting really lacks any kind of detail or any type of nuance in terms of who our audiences are and what their behaviors are. So that, that leads to kind of a lack of richer and deeper understanding of our digital users. But that being said, there is stuff that's out there and you can categorize, you can create quite broad segments of who our digital audiences are, pr producing kind of an abstract profile. There's two kind of clear distinctions. One is around um, their motivations um, and their information seeking behavior. 
uh, and then kind of this broad class of level of expertise. Are you a novice or are you an expert in either using technology or in cultural heritage? And more interestingly, more frequently starting now is this emerging mode of how people actually do interact with digital experiences. And I think that's where it's starting to get really interesting. Um, also, just really quickly, there's new uh, research that's coming out about audiences in response to the impact of COVID um, and looking at the emotional and social needs created um, by the pandemic lockdowns. And I think that's where it's going to become really, really interesting is thinking about shifting away from user behavior uh, and more to this idea of impact and value to audiences of our, our digital cultural heritage collections, experiences, projects. Um, I think that is what we need to be looking at is is, is impact and value uh, and and youth almost becomes secondary to that so yeah the pe people people and value are, are more important than youth and technology thank you very much there. thank you very much for your intervention and uh, moving uh, forward uh, moving to sarah sarah I, will, I do have slides if that's okay. I'll just try to um, share. Yes, you can, you can share. Let, let me know if it looks the way I'm hoping it will look. Um, can you see those slides? The full slide. We can see the full present uh, slide. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Um, well, it's like Claire and I um, practiced this. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd like to say we did, but we didn't. I think they flow really nicely. So firstly, thank you so much for um, welcoming me here uh, today. Um, as you heard, my name is Sarah Perry. I'm Director of Research and Engagement at MOLA, Museum of London Archaeology, and I'm formerly Senior Lecturer in Cultural Heritage Management at, at the University of York. Um, in these um, different roles, I, I've spent uh, many, many, many years um, at cultural sites around the UK, uh, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, grappling with the implications of digital technologies for um, visitor engagement and grappling with the additional challenges that come from doing this work at archaeological sites uh, of the very distant past where massive interpretative leaps are usually required for visitors to relate to deep time. What I feel that I've learned um, from this work is that cultural heritage and digital innovation simultaneously uh, suffer from and profit from similar challenges and opportunities. For example, both cultural heritage and digital in innovation are highly emotionally affecting for people. <laughs> Um, going back to Claire's point about emotion, um, although both are usually presented or often presented as though they are somehow objective and unaffected by emotion, uh, these emotional reactions that are generated from the technology, from the sites, um, uh, through users, are then often manipulated by those that have stakes in the technology or in the site, the heritage asset, or in both, resulting in real consequences for the users themselves and for others. And unsurprisingly, inequity is thus rife and is mutually reinforcing within both heritage and digital innovation. And this kind of compounding of inequities is testified to in a whole bunch of different um, reports that are out there. And Claire alluded to some of this work that's been com coming out specifically from um, studies of uh, uh, COVID and its impacts on the world. And one example that I just have a quote from here is uh, pub was published in May, um, a UK Parliament re research briefing on the impact of digital technologies on, on arts and culture in the UK, which found, among other things, that lack of diversity in the cultural sector is linked to inequities in digital ac access and literacy. So how I see and evaluate digital technologies in cultural heritage is driven by a justice-oriented values-led lens, going back to Claire's point about, about values. Um, so this, this lens is focused on making explicit what is usually taken for granted, um, both in heritage and in digital in innovation, and that is emotions, human values, and their impacts on equity. 
So I and my teams have been really inspired by a lot of different people and projects, and I've included just a few examples on the screen. This includes Emily Dawson and her colleagues' di very diverse work on equity in science education, including the YES STEM projects, Equity Compass, Sasha Castanda Chalk's design and justice work, and the Coal Digit Project's work on democratic innovation and digital participation, and then very many other things. And I've just included some screenshots um, on the slide uh, here for uh, those that can see it. I wouldn't say that any of the work that I've been doing here has been very easy. <laughs> because it confronts us with unco uncomfortable questions and realizations about emotions and values. And this often leads people to dismiss those emotions and values as unmanageable or unobjective, rather than recognizing that in dismissing them, we are thus enabling them to thrive unaccounted for with impacts that we also can't see. Um, so my approach has really been concerned with getting to the heart of people's values, designing visitor experiences with these values in mind, and then designing our evaluation frameworks to be equally responsive to and reflective on those values. And I'm gonna end by just mentioning two um, examples of projects that I've worked on, but there won't be any time to get into depth for them right now, but maybe later. Um, and there's some links I can provide. Uh, firstly, in, as part of the emotive project, the cultural, this cultural storytelling for heritage project, my teams led on the development of a set of design cards that were aimed at guiding users through developing, prototyping and evaluating emotionally engaging digital stories for and about um, cultural heritage sites. I won't go into details about um, the cards other than to say we use the prompts in them um, to help uh, inform the development of a series of full visitor um, experiences for cultural heritage sites, which aim to do a series of things which I've listed on the screen around driving participants into different forms of conversations about emotive topics, fostering specific types of outcomes with those um, visitors, explicitly using design tools. There's a great resource called Edge for Girls that's focused on equity. Um, and then evaluating the work in a way that is um, sensitive, as has been previously discussed by some of the other speakers, sensitive to the needs of those audiences rather than using generic approaches that are very standard in the sector. And the last um, example that I'll mention is from this Unpathed Waters project that Claire and um, Tarek and uh, Stuart and some of us on the line are working on right now, where we have purposefully set living project values that we're trying to use to um, drive how we relate with one another on the project, how we relate with our audiences. We're following a really specific methodology to hold ourselves to account to the values, to map our audiences and then redesign the values with their values in mind, and then to evolve our evaluation framework in, um, in light of these findings. So I'm gonna end there. I'm sure I've just generated more questions than answering anything, <laughs> but um, on the screen is a link to um, some of the work that we've done if you're interested in following up more. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Very interesting. And uh, our last speaker for this first session is Stuart. Uh, Stuart, please. Thank you very much, uh, Tarek. I'll also uh, share screen, although I only have a, uh, have a couple of slides. Uh, if everybody can see that, I hope. Excellent. Okay, so uh, um, it, it's really interesting coming last in the sequence of speakers. You say we're very diverse, but uh, as it happens, I think we, we've. Uh, uh, I, I'll be touching on uh, uh, topics that have been kind of quite fully explained by uh, by Brett, Claire, <laughs> and uh, and and Sarah uh, as uh, as well. So so my name is Stuart Jeffrey. I'm professor of digital uh, heritage at Glasgow School of Art. Again, uh, just for a little bit of context, I think it might be useful to know that my background uh, is in computer science and archaeology, and subsequently in uh, uh, digital archiving or data management in the archaeological sector. So I've got quite a particular uh, perspective in this as well, uh, that uh, I think using different language, but chimes very well with, the, with the, a lot of the points that have already been made. And I think, I think the first one, and I have to be, uh, Come clean in this is that I, I I don't have a huge amount of experience in museum sector, uh, so the kind of digital heritage that I'm talking about, or the type of uh, digital engagement, is generally speaking uh, either uh, site specific through immersives or or online, 
Um, and I'd also like to say that that, that like Claire, when we were when we were looking at the the kind of initial question that we're supposed to be talking about here, the first thing that struck me was uh, about the audiences. So we we were a, a general a general kind of uh, discussion about in, engagement with cultural heritage or visitor engagement with cultural heritage. But of course, virtually everything that flows from that is contingent on who those audiences are. And how they're actually interacting uh, uh, with this content. This content, and I think Claire explained that uh, uh, that really well, along with the the, the questions and issues around uh, evaluation that again flow from that. Uh, I'm also particularly interested in how people are actually consuming uh, the the uh, digital content that's been generated in the cultural heritage sector. I mean, literally physically consuming it. How are they actually uh, getting hold of it? Uh, and I'm particularly struck by the growth of uh, consumption via mobile devices and what that, what that actually means for us. Um, uh, uh, even in the context um, of what well, Brett was mentioning, mentioning augmentation of, of record sets, even if you're going in down the line of something like uh, augmented reality, if that's being delivered via a, a mobile device, what kind of experience does that actually deliver? And what kind of audiences are being encouraged uh, and uh, re reinforced in their activity, and what kind of audiences are being excluded by uh, uh, by those particular um, modes? I'd also uh, point out, and I, I, we may discuss this uh, later on, um, that there, there still remains, to a large extent, not not exclusively, but to a large extent, I think, uh, for digital dissemination technologies, quite a strong focus on the visual. There is not much thought kind of put into the other senses, particularly uh, uh, audio and what audio can do for us. And, and audio, as we know, is a, a highly uh, uh, effective mode of engagement. So I kind of come on again, building on, on what Claire and also what Sarah said there about one of the things that is the, the kind of the, the strongest locus of interest to me which is about um, emotional engagement with the digital object, and how we overcome some of the uh, some of the barriers to that, and the fact that um, the due to the technical origins of a lot of digital representation, or a lot of digital rep representations, kind of wear their technical or origins as as a as a badge of honour, and that there's much less focus on affect, which obviously uh, is is well explored in in the museum sector. And the idea that uh, affect or emotional engagement uh, not only produces the most memorable kind of uh, experiences and engagement, but also the, the most informative uh, forms of experience uh, and uh, 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 digital experiences. So, so in, in, in my work, what I've been looking at in order to try and uh, imbue uh, digital objects with some form of uh, emotional resonance. Uh, authenticity or, or however we want to describe this has been focusing on uh, two main strands. One is the idea of co-design and co-production, which is working together with either the audiences, which which in fact we are going to be doing in the, the Unpath project that Sarah mentioned, working together with the audiences or working together with a community of interest to actually co-produce the uh, uh, the digital heritage objects that, that we're working with and how that operates in terms of generating significance and generating a sense of ownership around those objects. I, I also have a strong anxiety, uh, and this will be it'll be interesting to hear other people's opinions on this, but uh, I, I have a strong anxiety, and it's maybe because I come from an art school now and I've and I've become acculturated, but authorship seems like a really strong element of how people receive things. The, the individuals and people who are actually involved in its production really genuinely matter in terms of how people emotionally consume uh, or emotionally engage with objects. And an awful lot of content that's generated still remains deliberately, I think, anonymized and corporatized. And it's, it's very hard to unpick that, that hidden hand behind the, uh, the, the production process. And kind of hand in hand with that is the is the notion uh, of of transience. Is how much of this content is is generated, is put out there, especially online, and how long does it last for? 
where does it go after three years or four years or five years or 10 years? Where does that stuff end up? And there was a kind of question about uh, the value of this material. If it's, if it's not being maintained in the long term or looked after the long term or considered as a form of artifact in its own right, if it's not being preserved, well, how valuable do the originators actually think it is if that stuff's not being, not being dealt with? And finally, I think using slightly different terminology, uh, this will echo uh, strongly with the, what Brett was uh, talking about in terms of an information ecosystem. Uh, and this is the idea of, of this kind of historical trajectory of digital content, where they start out as a time of uh, digital documentation, in essence, uh, and, and a, an attempt to use digital technologies to re record artifactual content, architectural content, sites, and so on. But then the, the records become artifacts in their own rights. They are an important object in their own right, and they carry with them signals to the production process and the values behind those production processes in, in the time they were actually made. And, and just the final point, I think, which resonates most with what Brett was talking about, is the final step in this process, or where we are now, where we're moving from record to artifact to portal, where we're actually looking at digital heritage objects as not a replication of the analog world, but we're fully exploiting the affordances of the digital world. So digital content, um, can become uh, any individual element of digital content essentially becomes a node in a much richer environment where there's multiple versions of various types of digital content or there's creative response to digital content and they can actually be bound together through uh, uh, through the processes i think by the sounds of it brett and i are both kind of looking into right now so I'll, I, I hope I haven't overrun, so I'll just stop there. Thank you very much, Stewart. Thank you very much uh, all for all uh, these five interventions, uh, uh, really insightful and from different perspective. So uh, uh, now the plan is to go through uh, three sessions and uh, three diff uh, short sessions to discuss key, key questions. We are a few minutes uh, um, behind, but we are doing great in terms of timing. So uh, I think we, we are, we, can, we will be uh, on uh, finishing on time anyway. So um, the first question, and each question will take 12 to 15 minutes. I would keep it to 12 to compensate the time properly and make people uh, or uh, preserve uh, um, audience session, question session. Uh, so the first question for our speakers to really uh, reflect on is, how has the adaptation of digital technologies in cultural heritage engagement uh, positively or negatively um, impacted on, on this field? Um, and what uh, are the key challenges? So who would like to take this first, our speakers? Uh, Brett, I see you attempting to go for it. Oh, I was just thinking, oh, we're all being very polite, aren't we? <laughs> so um, it, it, it's, it's interesting. So. Um, I mean, obviously, I talked about it from a sort of technology perspective, and it makes it it seem like I'm really interested in the technology. Um, as as Claire knows, I, I hate technology, all of it, really. Um, I think the pencil was the best invention we ever made, and I think it should have stopped there. Um, and I think that's a, one of, one of the things that I think is is um, interesting from a sort of technology perspective um, in in sort of cultural heritage is this perception. Um, and, and I think Stuart, you sort of touched on it in in the sort of the, the last. Um, kind of few years about how you know if we if we create an, a, a digital version of an analog object then that's that's kind of like uh that's a useful thing um and um when i was talking about augmenting um sort of uh, objects i was very very definitely not talking about that kind of um that sort of thing as you as you, as you, as you realize there there's been this sort of misperception of what technology can do that technology is a better version of real life i mean if we do a technology version of it then it's better um and i, I just think that's atrocious it's, it's kind of and but unfortunately is that that the newness is what attracts the money and so i think you know, money has been sort of draining out of the system in an attempt to sort of um, is to develop new ways of doing old things. Whereas actually what would be really interesting, I think, would be to find new ways of doing new things that are different from, but allow us to understand the old things in a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, and there are 
various ways around this. Sarah, you were talking about sort of different audiences and things like that, and you know, having an having an object, um, but having all of the stories that are told around the object from the different perspectives of the people that were sort of, you know, um, using it or oppressed by it. Um, that there's lots of different stories that that can be attached to um, to things using technology, and I think that's that's the interesting thing for me. Um, as I say, I think you can do that with a pencil sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so any any of our uh, speakers would like to continue on this or comment on this? Yes, uh, Stuart, please. Thanks. I, I, I just wanted to say that actually is that is that the, the the rapid adoption of these technologies has been what's been most problematic. I think in that I, I I think from 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 Brett's comments, I I, I get the sense well, that they that they may agree with us or everybody might agree with us is that. There is a certain kind of uh, excitement, just cultural excitement about technology, uh, and it's been adopted in 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 many instances when it isn't been absolutely clear that it, that is the best approach to adopt, and and that's that's not that doesn't just mean that oh well it turns out not to be the best approach you move on to something else. It actually has a slightly corrosive effect on how people will end up thinking about digital technologies. And there was an there was an interesting I, I was at an, uh, uh, quite an interesting meeting uh, up in Glasgow uh, recently with uh, some people in the um, uh, academic kind of uh, uh, and commercial domain. And one of the one of the things they were one of the points they were making about the adoption of digital technologies is that the difficulty with work, working with uh, academics is that we work in very kind of long timescales, quite slow timescales, and and we've got. Personally, I don't think it feels that way if you're working in a four or five year project. But the the the, the professional sector seems to be saying, oh, well, we need to respond much faster. And if we're going to work with academics, we need to respond much faster. And actually, I think there's a there's a sense that there, there really needs to be a space to think about these things slowly and in depth and not jump at the first a, a, a iteration of a new technology necessarily simply because it exists you've got to think about uh, the Im the impact of it ultimately on your uh, on your audience and your own practice thank you stewards uh, claire you wanted to come in just yeah just to kind of jump off from that i think that kind of the pervasiveness and the speed is really interesting and one of the key challenges i think in the cultural heritage sector is not necessarily around adoption or the speed of it but it, it is recognizing the digital literacy needs of the the, the cultural heritage organizations themselves to to think about well what digital skills i mean that there, there are there there are academics that believe you know the cultural heritage sector is in a post digital um phase and i disagree with that wholeheartedly because you know across cultural heritage organizations there there are massive skill gaps and 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 huge digital aspirations and it's how to balance those things out and i think there there's a, a larger question about whether those digital aspirations are in the are, are an appropriate aspiration to have but you know digital skills across all sectors are um are needed now and we need to support literacy and and um kind of capability to enable th things or at least uh, as Stuart said a kind of a, a space to think about things if people have the necessary digital literacy skills to then have a have a think space and I think that in itself is quite quite a challenge that because of the speed of technology affecting society we need um organizations to to ha have the skills to deal with it and to explore it in an appropriate way thank you claire thank you very much uh, that's interesting if, uh, from museum perspective alex or uh, uh, sara would you like to comment on that from your perspective from your experience so just to follow on, if Alex doesn't mind me jumping in, because it links to what Claire was saying, I had already been thinking that I wanted to kind of give a plug to the digital skills for heritage work that the NLHF National Lottery Heritage Fund, with support, I think, from DCMS, um, has been doing, because there's just so many exciting um, uh, 
initiatives there that are arising through um, work coming out of networks and work happening via Culture 24 and other organizations that are really attuned to I think exactly what um, Claire's. I thought I wondered if Josie was on the line too, so I can see from the chat that she um, she is. Um, I just having been participant in some of these, recognizing the the disparities in access and in skill, in um, opportunity, and so forth, has been very eye opening for me, and it really does reframe how you think about dig the digital. Um, in general, if you're working with a variety of organizations that may actually not not even be able to get onto a Word document, let alone, you know, immerse themselves in a VR headset. So um, that's what I wanted to add. Um, shout out to NLHF for the work. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Alex, would you like to add anything uh, from Mary Rose well, background or from Arcology? Um, yeah. A lot of it is sort of what I alluded before. It's It's people's understanding increasing and them suddenly going, wow, now I see it. And I think for our, our visualizations of the ship, that's really, really worked well with all of them. And we're also able to, to sort of give them a bit of an experience and feel that they might be submerged in the water and, and look at the wreck the way it was that you, you couldn't do it any other way. So I think those things are very good, but again, it, it's balance. The other things you, you compare that with, sometimes we have a, a replica of the brick galley, which is at the bottom of the ship, a big one where you cook food for 250 of the 500 crew. So it's quite a big thing and actually do a cooking session. So you can smell the stuff, you get the same sort of uh, ingredients that we use to make the Tudor, the, uh, the, the broth for the crew. And that has, people completely engaged as well because that's touching all of their senses so when we have tables where we've got real rope that you can still smell the tar on you know that's that's engaging so it's it's horses for courses and it is getting the balance right and it's being able to have the real and, and augment people's experience and interaction with them with the real things that perhaps they might not be able to touch in a, in a different way and I think that's what's exciting um yeah so the cooking event's really good and again, it's 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 experiences that you can't perhaps give in another way. You have to do it digitally, like trying to, uh, we're doing this 4D cinema at the moment, which is combined um, new digital technology with models of the ship, with the scans of the ship, with um, effects of water, with wind, with bouncy seats and all sorts of things. So that's going to try and immerse people in a dive on the wreck and tunneling underneath, under the ship. Well, that's something that, that we wouldn't be able to do with just a, a picture book or, or panels on the wall. So again, it's getting the balance, but it's also, it's quite expensive. I mean, we're lucky we've got partners to do a lot of this, but that's the other thing for small museums that then might feel that because they can't do anything digital, they're not giving, um, you know, that they're not responding to the, to the needs of a modern audience. That's a bit, a, a bit worrying. Uh, so there are lots of things to think about, basically. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, actually, I'm capturing from uh, this discussion that there are key things to really, uh, for us, uh, before using digital technologies, to think about that, first of all, people, audience, but second is basically what immersive experience means. So immersive experience is not digital experience, and they, they are totally different. And this is really important to think about, uh, like uh, um, what uh, other colleagues mentioned today, like uh, it's not technology. It, it, technology is not only about, uh, we can achieve with low tech some, some uh, quite in, uh, impactful uh, immersive. So, and again, the experience and the people is basically what should define what this immersive look like and what should um, uh, uh, deliver. Um, and that's basically because we have one minute, I'll uh, kind of, I, I'll, uh, I want to really uh, get your um, uh, answer on this question came from Clara, the president of uh, iCommerce UK. Uh, and the question say, uh, because it's related, the question say, is the public uh, 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 as excited about digital technologies associated with cultural heritage as the professionals, how how the sector is taking the public uh, uh, with them. So maybe maybe that is a very difficult question, but some, anyone would like really to... Um... I, I have an answer for that one, Tarek. Yes, please, Brent. <laughs> um, so uh, following up what, what Alex said, yeah, I think there is a difference between sort of um, 
large scale museums and sort of smaller scale museums and and, and in a former existence Claire and I worked with um, on, a, on a project to look at sort of local museums um, and, and what audience wanted um, and what was really interesting is that we, we, we framed the whole thing about what it would look like in sort of um, 10 years 20 years 30 years um, as a way of trying to get their blue skies kind of thinking about what technology could do um, and as Claire knows, the, the best finding ever in any study ever was that people just wanted a nice slice of cake and clean toilets. Um, and, you know, and that's that's what they wanted. They wanted something easy. They wanted to be able to, to go. They wanted to be able to move around a space in a nice way. They didn't want to have to put on headsets or try to work out different controls. And, um, you know, and, and the, the project that we were doing wasn't around you know, necessarily making that sort of thing. But um, we were looking at what, what they thought the experience would be, and, and it was just good cake, nice clean toilets. <laughs> so, Thank you, Brett. Uh, that, that's uh, go, going back to the experience that yeah. they want, actually. Um, any um, uh, far, uh, any uh, kind of uh, further uh, information on this answer from any of our speakers? Uh, Stuart, I, I just want to I just want to make the point again that that I agree I agree well I definitely agree with the cake actually but also the like more generally I think that the, 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 we're we're kind of doing the same thing again where we're treating the public as a single entity or a single group a single group of audiences and the, at the I, there is actually sections of the public who are more excited about digital technology than the professionals you know I, I, and and then there's whole swathes uh, who I, I, as Sarah was describing, uh, and I think we're going to go on and talk about it, who, who simply can't access it. Don't, it's not that they, they don't know how to use it, they can't access it for very for, for, for multiple different reasons. So there, there's a real there's a real spectrum there. And I think kind of picking up on, on Alice's point is that, it, that this is a balance. It is uh, it, certainly for, for a visitor experience, you want to bal balance the experience out to, to be as appealing, I guess, to as many people as you possibly can. But there is a constituency who who get really excited about engagement via technology and that, that's how they would pre prepare to uh, uh, consume things. Yes, thank you very much. And that's basically nicely move me to the second uh, uh, session uh, around uh, another question. Maybe you'll find it related to what we have been discussing as well. So the second question um, is, what is the impact of the rapid development of digital technologies on the valuation and perception of cultural heritage? So uh, another 10 minutes to digest this and talk about this. Uh, who would like to take this on? First, of course. What do you think, Claire, from a, a kind of deeper experience perspective and this rapid development? Well, against my my my, Kind of response here is because I I, I know Karen's on the call, but we're we're working on it on something uh, another thing about valuation of of, of digital uh, cultural heritage, and I I think that the the term valuation and impact are really problematic, um, and the the value of of, of digital cultural heritage will to the value to who, to whom, because um, there are so many different kinds of value. You're talking about economic value, you're talking about cultural value, you're talking about political value, aesthetic value, uh, emotional value. What what are what are we talking about here? And I I think just as kind of Stuart was alluding to in terms of um, what do we mean by the public, we need to have a bit more of a nuanced understanding uh, of who and what we mean when we're saying these big things around impact about perception about valuation because it's much more nuanced than that and and kind of values and impact changes over time and it's really shaped by contextual factors um, and cultural trends and and this is where it gets really tricky um and and the the rapid development of digital technology is almost immaterial because un, unless we understand the who 
and what we mean by these terms, the, the speed of, uh, of development uh, it doesn't really help. So that hasn't really answered the question. It's just interrogated a little, it a little bit more. Sorry. <laughs> Absolutely useful because it's really important, as we mentioned, as it clearly demonstrated with this discussion, that in-depth understanding before really attempting to use technology is really important. Any further comment on particularly any any impact uh, or any impact you have experienced? That's all right, do it. I definitely wouldn't have Wilson. I'd have Dan James on. I would have Sorry for that, guys. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with that. So uh, our speakers. Yes, uh, Stuart, please. Sorry. I, I, yeah, I just... Uh, I just wanted to make a, a, another point about the development of digital technologies and the rapid development is it's, it's not is it that that's kind of happening anyway it's not like digital digital cultural heritage is the origin and the driving force of most of these digital technologies we're, we're adopting them and they're they're becoming pervasive and, and it doesn't mean that we have to follow suit so actually it's the rap i would argue it's the rapid too rapid adoption of some of these technologies that actually causes the problem in our sector but but the 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 kind of the, the the rapid evolution and the pervasiveness and the splintering of society in many in many ways into you know digital haves and haves nots and so on that that's that's happening and it's whether whether we want to engage in kind of mitigating that and being very thoughtful about what's adopted or whether we want to kind of go on to the next big thing as uh, as as slaviously as possible, but but I think everybody, uh, all all the all the speakers here are probably, you know, have been have been engaged with this long enough to know that the that the kind of the wow factor about a new technology doesn't doesn't last that long. It's like once 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 people are are no longer amazed, they really do start asking themselves, is this particularly helpful? And that that's that's kind of one of the reasons why why at the at the the beginning in the 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 my kind of my in in the introduction um what, what i was trying to say about a, a a kind of emotional engagement uh and an understanding is that is that we have a lot that we had a lot of technologies that, that that clearly came from technology that was their that was their route that's why they were with us they were technologies they weren't about appreciating and understanding and connecting with the past they were they were technologies rather than servants. No. Yeah. Thank no. you very much, Stuart. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, any other comments before we move to the third and last question, Brett? Yeah. It's just um. So I think you were at that at the um the, the the UN thing the other day. Um, which was really interesting because it was talking around sort of heritage and rather than sort of looking back, um, so it was really something Stuart you just said about about reminded me. Um, um, and part of the the sort of the the conversation there was about what what will be our legacy for the future and thinking about sort of heritage as our as our sort of um, constructed legacy really. Um, and I think um, I, I, because I was aware of time, I sort of cut the last bit of what I was going to say sort of off earlier. Um, but one of the things that interests me in terms of technology is, is a sort of is a sort of a passive, pervasive use of technology rather than the the um the uh you know, I have to bring my own device or I've got to put on a headset about the fact that the the information is embedded um and the experience is embedded in the environment that you're sort of moving through, which is sort of interesting. Um to do that is quite tricky, but what it needs is it needs building blocks. And I started talking about that sort of ecosystem. Um, and I think what I think is interested with the rapid development of technology, it was basically build an expensive hardware um, and then sort of throw it away and then get another expensive hardware and then throw it away. And, um, and actually, I think in thinking about the future, the hardware is the least important part of it. Um, and actually, what we need to be thinking about is what um what sort of values, what stories, what information, what emotions we are embodying in our sort of digital um, experiences and how we can kind of create those as a sort of, um, as a record almost of what we want to leave for the future, for future preservation. Um, and then that as associates our uh, culture with the culture that we're already trying to preserve. And, and I think the sort of point I was trying to make is that actually, if we start thinking about that as an ecosystem, 
then our, our sort of our our additions become part of that preserved sort of um, ecology that goes forward. And I think that's kind of more of an interesting way of perhaps sort of thinking about this. That I think the rapid development of technology has shown us what not to do. <laughs> quite, yeah. quite 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 obviously, don't do that. That was bad. Um, and um, now we're sort of starting to get a bit more aware of actually um, why that wasn't a good idea. Um, I, I love, I love, um, as sad Tarek as with you actually, when we went to the museum, it re remained un unnamed. We were talking to them about what it is that they were they were thinking about. And they sort of reached into the drawer and pulled out the, pulled out the previous version and went, oh, it was this hardware. And you just think, great. So we're doing the same thing again, but you've already not used it once. It's kind of like, <laughs> So I think there were some interesting ways of re reevaluating and rethinking what our legacy will be, I think. And I think that's. Yeah, um, and uh, I agree with you uh, um, and all your comments. And I would uh, this highlight the importance of thinking about the sustainability of our approach of using digital technologies and how we really um, could could provide something self-sustained or a, a kind of uh, for longer uh, uh, for longer use and long, longer impact rather than uh, just because we are excited about uh, um, uh, motion capture and heritage now. So that's basically uh, 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 the trend and basically it, it kind of, uh, we know technology is obsolete after a certain um, amount of time and the model, uh, Brett, you were mentioning uh, in the museum uh, w was not working on any device because mainly was not really built to really be sustainable, be, to be self-sustained for the future. And we are talking about the preservation uh, while, so that contradict with, with the concept of conservation and preservation. So that's really interesting. And that's basically uh, moved me nicely to the second question, the third question, sorry, where um, is really an important point about accessibility of heritage. And, um, the question is, do you, do you see the adaptation of digital technologies supporting equal access to heritage? How do we address the, the digital divide uh, in using digital technologies? Who, who would like to take this? I think this is, uh, I, I expected you, Sarah, to come first because it's all about accessibility and people. Please, Sarah, go ahead. <laughs> The, my answer to this question was the same as the answer to the question before, so I wasn't going to say anything. And then Brett kind of prefigured what I was going to um, say anyways, which is that I don't, we aren't going to see equity unless we purposefully design our work with the, this embedded at the core of it. And the thing that I think um, I struggle a little bit with in the cultural heritage sector is the lack of awareness of the huge number of frameworks and existing practice that is coming out of especially critical science and technology studies, critical data studies, and other fields that have been testing out and thinking through different methodologies for doing this kind of value sensitive design or design justice based um, work. You know, I had the reference to Sasha Costanza Chalk or Ruha Benjamin. I can list a whole bunch of other names, but there are a lot of existing and developing models of practice that we can learn from. Um, and going back to the point about having enough time to do some of this work, the nature of their work means that it's getting embedded into what are typical design processes anyways. <laughs> Um, so by following some of the logic that they're trying to infuse into the design process, you've got the time there to do it, you've got the critical thinking lens, um, and you've got a variety of practitioners that have been working at the forefront of especially artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's a lot of stuff going on there um, right now that we can use as models um, of practice. So we're, you know, we're not having to invent stuff out of nowhere, there's a lot that we can draw, draw upon. So. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, any um, uh, of our speakers would like to uh, follow on about the the, the question uh, and the, the concept of accessibility? Claire, you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that really stands out for me, so um, is this this 
quote from the DCMS, their culture is, is digital report. This is in 2018. Um, and they're highlighting that one of the key benefits of digital technologies in the, in the cultural heritage sector is the capacity to reach larger and more diverse audiences, including those who have been previously disengaged or uninterested. Um, uh, and that's such a, a, a big claim to be making around technology and and what we are seeing in 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 kind of the cultural heritage sector is that actually digital engagement and participation um is actually echoing the patterns of participation of physical cultural heritage and it's dominated by those who are highly educated so they've got a degree or higher they're already engaged with the organization um, they're also female or identify as, as female um, and they're white and it, it, it's really it, there's just reproducing exactly the same hierarchies and inequalities that already exist in physical cultural heritage participation and I think Sarah, Sarah's point's really important that there, there's so much um, models of practice and frameworks that are happening in other sectors that we haven't really adapted or adopted in either physical or digital engagement. Um, and that's huge. And I don't think we should separate out the two. We need to address both in parallel because um, it's really important because, it, and you know, I, I, it, 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 it's just, it, it's hard to, to know that we're only really talking to uh, someone who's got a degree and who's a white woman. <laughs> um, you know, I don't really want to be talking to myself. Um, not really. Uh, so it, it, it's a, about how we create the, these environments to, to have more open discussions about the fact that the sector, it, it, the sector itself is problematic and we need to think about that. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Uh, um, any of our speakers would like to uh, follow on that? Brett? Yeah, so uh, just sort of following on, I think, so what I was talking about before, um, and, and I think part of the problem is there, there is an active need to engage with a cultural heritage organisation and there's an active need to be able to engage with technology. You have to kind of seek that out. You have to go to a museum or you have to search for something. Um, and I think what, what sort of interests me and, 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 and again, sounds like Claire and I work together all the time. Maybe um, it, it, There was a sort of project that we were thinking about, about sort of passive um, heritage. Um, and so uh, around Portsmouth, there's lots of objects that have been collected up and moved to museums and moved to um, resources and things like that, um, archives. And, and what we were looking at was thinking, well, how do we go back and engage with the streets where those objects and things came from? Because although the, 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 the objects in the archive came from those streets, the people on those streets will never go to the museum or never go to an archive. Um, so um, in this particular instance, what we did was we um, we did sort of scanning of, of, of objects and then we went out and, and put them back on lampposts where they were found. Um, so we attached them back to their original object and, and, and with a little sort of QR code so that people could find out more information about it. Um, and the point of that is it was it was partly a passive thing. It was it, the information was there. You didn't have to go to the museum to see the object that came from your street. It was on your street where it came from. Um, and I think there is um, there is a, 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 an idea that's been sort of ticking away. Um, I think now about thinking about, and this is what I'm talking about, sort of ecosystems, where actually we need to not think about it as sort of a heritage organisation. We need to be thinking about it as a kind of uh, as a, as an equality platform that you can access inside a, a museum or you can access in an architectural establishment, but you can also access out on the street and thinking about putting that information that we we sort of gather and collect and repackage and how do we get that out of the museum and back in into the communities so that there's this sort of permeant um permeable sort of membrane between the sort of the environment that people live in and then moving into sort of heritage organizations um 
I'm not really sure how to do that. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't think anyone does, but you know, we, we've talked before about, um, um, uh, I, I like to come up with really, really stupid ideas that are almost impossible to do that. So that's just part of like, that make, makes life interesting. Um, you know, and we, we, we've talked about, you know, like having sort of lamps in streets that just project down information. So as you just walk along the street, you know, or that when the, the street light turns on, as you're walking, it casts shadows and you can read as you go. You know, it requires no effort, no technology on your part. The technology is all flipped to the other way so that you're 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 automatically accessing the 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 environment, but the cultural environment rather than just the physical environment. And I think there's a really interesting way of, of doing that, but it's not going to be done um, in the way I heard the other day where I was talking to somebody and then went, oh, yeah, but like your iPhone can do that now. And I was like, yeah, but I don't have one. And they were like, oh, well, why not? You know, <laughs> well, I don't I don't want one. I don't need one. Other people have them, but not everybody has them. It's just a sort of assumption from some technology people that, that their level of technology is the same level of technology that everyone has. And actually, we need to be thinking that about the the need for engagement with with culture is the same need that everybody else has and we need to work out how we can allow them to engage with it in ways that we can automatically but perhaps they they don't so i guess that's but, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you thank you Blake. Blake. that's exactly you, you see a lot of agreements in the chat with this with some expansion on that and um, so, uh, uh, any other further uh, uh, comments on that? We are doing great in terms of time, actually. Uh, yes, Sarah? Sorry, just to kind of build on some of what Brett was saying, um, because I work at Museum of London Archaeology and we're the main um, provider of archaeological services around the UK, which means that we're literally digging stuff up out of people's neighbourhoods <laughs> Um, and then it's going into archives all over the place. And um, this is one of the things that we've been trying to champion. And it's been a very challenging process because there's no better space than archaeology that's literally happening in communities all around us all the time to do exactly what you're saying. The communities are being developed. They're having new lighting systems, you know, implemented new architectural designs happening this, that, and the uh, all over the place. There's so many opportunities, Brett, to do exactly what you're saying. And some of the kind of championing of change here has has to come at a variety of different levels. A lot of those of us in the community are obviously trying to advocate um, for, for this, but developers themselves have to um, come on board. There has to be more um, government intervention. And one thing that we have, and I'll drop a uh, link to it in the chat, is that we have just one this impact, um, going back to the term impact um, grant to enable um, experimentation with different types of partners in doing exactly this kind of work with materials the minute that it's excavated or even before. So it would be great it, maybe to carry on this conversation with you and others about how we might be able to use some of this impact money to experiment with exactly what you're um, talking about in partnership with developers and others. I'll drop a link in the, in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, any uh, further comments before I kind of... Okay. So what I'm hearing here is really important um, because we really need to know what heritage information we are preserving, first of all. So like what uh, Brett and Sarah commented on that, a heritage could be in, uh, very intangible or very tangible, but without really contextualizing it within the environment. So presenting heritage within the environment is the strongest way of preserving it uh, and let community engage with it, not only about preservation, but also about engagement here. And that's why basically we can see like digital technology definitely contributed to wider accessibility of information. But like the main question is, currently really um, a hot topic is, did it contribute to the diversity and inclusivity of people engaging with heritage? That's really big topic now. Uh, uh, and mainly basically that's that's what make um, many people excited about uh, critical heritage, this, uh, uh, critical heritage and heri looking at heritage as an inclusive and critical discourse and starting in, by empowering community really to, uh, 
to 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 bring the heritage, to bring the intangible heritage, and really frame it and contextualize it within the tangible. So heritage could be really sometimes a way of life or oral history, but also could be like archaeology digged somewhere, um, which is really important. Uh, one example is a neighboring uh, archaeological site, Fishbone, like within the village, but the villagers are uh, interesting. It's interesting that the villagers are not really um, uh, owning that heritage, but it is really under their village. So that's really important uh, element uh, about contextualizing heritage before re really thinking about how technology could contribute to the inclusivity and accessibility of the heritage. And everything we heard today basically is about thinking about the how, what heritage and how we are really uh, going to build the experience that preserve this heritage and engage people with before really thinking about what tech we would use uh, in that. So uh, by this note, I really would like to thank every speaker about their contribution and would like to open uh, the uh, uh, platform to audience really to ask. We have we can have 10 minutes of questions and I would really start with a question um, uh, from Ruth actually because I was following. I, I think I hope I didn't miss any question. So Ruth is asking, what does the panel think uh, um, is the potential of digital technology to engage in enable processes of uh, restitution and decolonization? So that's a, bring us back to the concept of diversity, inclusivity and diversity, I think, or sort of. So any uh, of the panel um, uh, colleagues could really uh, start with answering this question. Yes, Stuart? So, so not specifically on de on decolonization, but on, on restitution. I don't see digital <clears throat> technologies as being it, it, massively different from the, the kind of continuum of replication technologies that, but, that have already existed. So it's, it, it, it's it, there's not a question that, oh, well, there's there's a there's a better version, so the the, the so you know the object should be it, it given back or restituted or whatever. The, the the question is that should be happening in in any event, and the kind of technologies that are available to us are neither neither here nor there. There there was a brief moment in I guess the the early two thousands when uh, some scholars were talking about about the uh, the idea of kind of. Uh, digital restitution, where you you would you would create a digital copy and you could gift that digital copy back. This is because museums didn't want to to give up their their material artifacts, or they were pointing to legal constraints around that. So you could gift back the digital the the digital version. It just seems so entirely back to front to me. I mean, if it, it, you know, you know, if there's a copy, if if it's that good, you keep that and and obviously give back the original. Uh, item, but I've just returned to my fact that, uh, sorry, returned to that point that the arguments about re restitution are kind of not contingent on the technology at all. They're, they're, they they stand in their own. They stand in their own, basically. Thank, thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, um, uh, any uh, co uh, uh, other colleague would like to uh, touch upon uh, the question or from different perspective? And for uh, uh, um, audience, please uh, uh, write your question in the chat, or we will give you uh, uh, in a minute the platform to speak if you like. But when we finish answering this question, uh, any other answer you have, a uh, comment about the uh, question you have, colleagues? No? Just a, a just a kind of a, a, a follow on. I completely agree with Stuart, but I think one of the things that potentially kind of 3D technologies can do is actually open up the conversation around um, decolonization, around repatriation and around democratizing of heritage by using it as a, as a mechanism for provocation and for, for discussion, um, but not as a means of uh, repatriation itself. Um, the, I mean, there was, there was a huge piece, piece of work um, uh, was it the Nefertiti hack in 2015, um, where where some some artists had kind of secretly uh, claimed to have secretly scanned um, 
a, a bust of this e Egyptian queen uh, from a museum in Berlin and then freely released it um, on online. Uh, and it was under the intention to kind of return this Egyptian queen to the to her homeland. Um, but it, it 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 was it acted as a as a, a point of conversation, and I think that's really important. It's about opening up lines of communication around really difficult and challenging, or well, not difficult and challenging, but really important um, topics. And I think technology can help to enable that in some way. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, uh, any further question from the audience? Uh, please uh, write on the, in the chat. Uh, any final question? Uh, we have uh, we do have three minutes to go through any question you would have, or unmute yourself and speak, please, if you like to ask a question. As a final question, we'll give it uh, ten seconds to. Okay, maybe maybe uh, th uh, it was um, uh, really answering every question would come to because we had a lot of questions to discuss. I, and I really uh, thank you, uh, our uh, speakers and our audience for engaging with this uh, topic. And this is, as I mentioned, one of three uh, roundtable discussions we will have around using digital technologies and in cultural heritage context. We will move uh, in the next two round table discussion into different disciplines and different points of, uh, kind of, uh, of, of view. But I would like also to remind you that ICOMOS has a lot of activities and also a lot of committees you can engage with if you are in, interested in cultural heritage and in joining ICOMOS, please uh, email us to ask about um, uh, membership, uh, joining us uh, or joining our committee if you are engaged and interested in um, using digital technologies in cultural heritage. I would like to remind colleagues and audience about the Christmas uh, lecture. My colleague will uh, had uh, has added um, uh, uh, the, the links to in the chat. Uh, I hope we, we you can see them, but also please, uh, uh, if Helen can add them again to the audience, uh, you can attend uh, and join us in person or online. Uh, it's a great opportunity to finish with the, the year with uh, some amazing work happening um, uh, outside the UK, of course, but really uh, informing our understanding of heritage and conflict in a way, or heritage and in, in difficult context in a way. So uh, uh, I hope all you can join us. Uh, and thanks again for the speakers and the audience for this amazing evening. I know we got the, uh, 30, 30 minutes almost from the football, for people cheering for England and Wales or both, or for the football. So uh, I wish you very, very nice evening and many thanks for contributing to this evening, uh, this first round table discussion. I'll uh, call this to close uh, by thanking everyone and thanking ICOMOS and Clara in particular, the president of ICOMOS in supporting us to really uh, giving us the kind of the, the gateways to support best practice from our disciplinary point of view. So thank you all. Thank you, Clara, for everything. And have a nice evening.